Amen. Um, we're going to jump into the message in a moment, but I felt like I had a word and I just wanted to share it. The Lord was speaking to me about Syria this week in one of my quiet times. And I just wanted to read you the verse where you're speaking it to me. And then I just had the sense that there might be some people here, uh, maybe you're with YWAM or I'm not sure, that might have Syria on your heart. And I feel that the Lord's prompting you with a yes. I was reading in Matthew 4, 24, it says, the news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, uh, paralytics, and he healed them. And the Lord just gave me a picture that the gospel, I really feel like the Lord's saying there's going to be a new move in Syria specifically of the gospel, and that he wants some of us to be part of it. And so if the Lord has had that on your heart, or maybe he's dropping it in your heart this morning, um, number one, I just want us to be praying for what God's going to be doing there. And then number two, some of you, the Lord may have already showed you how he wants you to get involved, and he's just waiting for your, your yes. Got it? And you're like, no. <laughs> That's okay. He'll show you. All right, we're continuing this morning in our series in the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 8. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, but we've been looking at this kind of journey through the book of Acts, seeing how God birthed the church, and then how the church acts. And honestly, our desire is, what can we glean from them? There was such a mighty move of God in the first century. And, and, and I truly believe that what they begun isn't as good as what we're going to be able to see in our lifetime. Amen. God constantly moves from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Everything he does gets better with age, including the church. And so we're just excited as we look to them. And I, and I, I really want us to be careful with our mindset because some of us have this mindset when we read the book of Acts. Well, that was then, man, if we could just get to do like they did. No, no, you have to understand we get to, to, get to you know, launch off of what they accomplished into something even greater. And I want us to come to the book of Acts with these great hopes, these great expectations that if God used them mightily, he wants to use us even more mightily. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, as we continue through Acts, what we're going to see today is that as the church grew and grew and grew because of the preaching of the apostles, the ministry of all the saints, and more importantly, the Holy Spirit on everything they did, they kind of got stuck. You ever been stuck in life before? Right? You're just like, man, this is such a great season. Things are going well, and things were going well for the church. And they began to get comfortable. And they kind of got stuck. Where did they get stuck? In Jerusalem, where the Holy Spirit first fell, where the apostles were. The church was growing and growing and growing. Yes, there was some messes that was happening, but it just kept growing, and they were getting comfortable, and they forgot what their mission was. Do you remember what their mission was? We find in Acts chapter 1-8, right before Jesus leaves, he says this, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be my witnesses telling people about me where? everywhere it says in jerusalem judea samaria and the ends of the earth now they did great in jerusalem but they forgot about the greater part of judea they certainly didn't like samaria and the ends of the earth they were just not even on their minds at this point and so the lord helps them get unstuck and you know how he got helped them get unstuck he turned up the heat a little bit you ever had an experience where the lord turned up the heat in your life <laughs> And the Lord allowed, he didn't cause, but he did allow persecution to break out in this early church. If you look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, this great wave came with Saul, who would later become Paul, at its head. It was Paul that was leading the charge going throughout all Jerusalem, eventually to Damascus, Samaria, all these places searching out the Christians, arresting them, killing some, men, women, children. He didn't care who it was. He said, I am going to stomp this thing out. And so this wave of persecution came. Now, what happened when the persecution came? They scattered. If you imagine like this ball, this clusters of, of Christians spirit-filled, gospel-centered, all in Jerusalem. And God's like, you guys are just, you're just bound too much together. And so persecution comes in. They just scatter. And I love what it says. It says, in Jerusalem, and all the believers, 
except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. And it goes on and says in verse four, it says, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Doesn't that just get you excited? Amen. Now, I want you to notice a couple things. Number one, it did not say the evangelists who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Some of us are like, okay, that's just for the evangelists. That's not my gifting. That's not my job. No, no, it just said the believers. Wherever they went, the believers just started talking about Jesus. And I love the picture of this because it's, it's like Luke is trying to paint a picture for us that as a believer, sharing Jesus is, is just as natural as breathing. You may not be really great at it. You may not be an evangelist, you know, by trade or, or by anointing or gifting evenly. And there's a legitimate uh, gifting uh, of, of an evangelist. But we've got to just break past some of that and just realize as a believer, talking about Jesus is just natural. We don't have to be good about it, but we're just going to purposely bring it up in conversation because Jesus has so radically changed our lives. Now, it wasn't just believers. There were evangelists that we're going to see in a moment, too, that got dispersed, got scattered as this persecution came. Now, here's the other thing I want you to notice. Notice that it said all the believers except who? The apostles. I love that God did that. Now, the apostles are listening to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit said, stay in the heat of persecution. That was their act of obedience. But it's like God was saying, look, this isn't about superstars. The kingdom's not going to expand just through superstar apostles. The kingdom's going to expand through believers, not just evangelists, but all believers as they're, expa- as they're just scattered, as they're going wherever they are. Okay, I'm fleeing persecution. I'm going to go to Samaria. I'm going to go to this town, and I'm just going to bring Jesus and do life with Jesus wherever I am. Does that make sense? John Wimber had this phrase. I was talking about this at Elite Drive last week. He helped start the Vineyard Movement, and he said, everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play. In the kingdom of God, everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to do the stuff, which means each and every one of you were created with a unique design, a unique call, a unique purpose, and that you were significant to the kingdom of God. Whatever you're doing, whether you're a plumber, you work at Target, you're a teacher, if you're a preacher, a minister, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, you've got a significant call on your life to tell people about Jesus. You can tell who the evangelist is with us today, amen? (laughs) Now, we go on, and we're going to pick up in verse 5, and I'm just going to kind of brush over it quickly, but we're introduced to not just one of the believers, but a specific evangelist, somebody with the gift. In verse 5, we're introduced to Philip, and it says that Philip, as he's, you know, under this pressure of persecution, goes up to Samaria, and he begins preaching the gospel, because that's just what we do as believers And it says that Samaria, and particularly one of the cities in Samaria, there's this massive revival that takes place. Signs, wonders, miracles start happening as he's just being a Christian, as he's preaching the gospel, talking about Jesus with people. And essentially, a church gets planted in that city on that day. Ministry's going great. Philip, if you've read the story, calls for backup from Peter and John because the Holy Spirit hadn't hadn't fallen on the believers yet. Peter and John come down. They pray for them to get filled with the Holy Spirit. They've received Christ. Now they've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's just exploding. I mean, it's just revival in this city. And then God does something really strange. God actually takes the catalyst, the one in in essence who is stewarding and pastoring this revival in Samaria, and he says, I want you to leave Samaria. Any of you ever had an experience where you're working for the Lord, things are going great, you're seeing things happen, you're like, man, this is incredible, look what God's doing, and then he says, leave, and you're like, no, 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 this happened because I'm amazing, and this, if I leave, it's not going to happen anymore, and God's like, if you don't leave, you're going to spoil it, it's essentially what we did to Philip, pick up with me, Acts chapter 8, verse 26, it says, as for Philip, An angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, this was uh, the pathway, essentially, that people would take to go from Jerusalem down to Egypt, kind of into Africa. And it was a desert road. Gaza was kind of an oasis. It was kind of one of the last watering places before you actually got into Egypt. And so an angel of the Lord comes to Philip and says, go. 
Now notice what the angel does not say. He does not tell Philip why he's going. He doesn't even tell Philip where he's going. He says, there's the path, start walking. Now, this was a really clear word of the Lord, was it not? Like if you have an angel of God show up and speak audibly to you, you're pretty confident in that word, amen? Amen. But the angel doesn't give him details. It's much like Abraham when God came and said, go, where am I going? I'm not gonna tell you, just go, right? And so Philip has to make a decision. Am I going to trust this strong word of the Lord enough to leave obviously what God is doing in his birth in Samaria to go see what possibly the next thing is that he's calling me into? Very, very clear word of the Lord. Now, at this point, Philip has no idea what's going to come from his step of obedience. Fast forwarding through the story, you guys have probably read it. He meets this Ethiopian eunuch who's one of the the leaders in Ethiopia, essentially, over all. uh, He's basically like the head IRS agent. He's over the entire treasury of, of Ethiopia. He meets him, leads him to the Lord, but at this point, he has no idea that this simple step of obedience to a clear word of the Lord is gonna lead to what Acts shows us is the first Gentile convert. He has no idea that this simple step of obedience to a clear word of the Lord is going to crack open the continent of Africa to the gospel. All he knows is that he has a clear word of the Lord, and he obeys it. But it really doesn't make sense, because in his mind, he's going, is this right? I mean, isn't this irresponsible to leave what God started in Samaria through my hands? Well, it's not irresponsible if it's the Lord giving you a clear word. It's not irresponsible if it's God directing you to keep on, to drop everything, and to move. And so we see Philip obey that simple word, and he starts walking, and he starts walking, and he starts going down this wilderness road heading towards Gaza from Jerusalem. Now, as we go through this message today, uh, I'm just going to basically look at what are some of the keys to evangelism, and they're really simple. What are some of the keys to be used by God to lead other people to Jesus? And I think we learned the first one right here from Philip, and it's simply this. Just choose to show up. Just choose to show up. When God says go there, just choose to show up and be there, right? Here's Philip, and God said go that direction. He can be like, Lord, I got a lot on my to-do list, and it's kind of inconvenient. He, he just chose to show up and obey what God had called him to do to actually get around the people that God had wanted to be around to actually see those salvations happen. And I honestly think this is the first key, kind of the first half of, you know, the key to evangelism is just show up. Be around the people that God wants you to be around. My wife and I experienced this this week. Uh, We live in Pualani Estates on the very bottom street, Ho'omama Street. I'm not going to give you my address because I don't want you guys to bother me, but I'm joking. I'll give you Bill's address. You can bother him. (laughs) But essentially, we are at the epicenter of Halloween on the entire west side of our island. (laughs) Truly. We have around 2,000 people that come by trick-or-treating at our house. And so a couple weeks ago, we we were talking with one of our wild evangelist friends. And we said, hey, what do you do in Halloween? Why don't you come to our house? We'll provide 2,000 people for him. You can share the gospel. (laughs) He's like, awesome. I'll get a group. And so our friend shows up, but, but you have to understand, about the, the couple days before Halloween, Sarah and I are just kind of getting hit with confusion, with kind of a, honestly, it was attacked from the enemy. We really don't like Halloween. We don't like celebrating Halloween necessarily. There's a lot of demonic stuff that goes along it, but we just have this thought, okay, God has placed us in the epicenter for a reason. And so literally up to about an hour before we're supposed to start handing out candy, we're like, maybe we should just call them. Let's just cancel. I think maybe we should just get out of here. There's all this stuff that was happening. And then the Lord just gave us a clear word, confirmed it through other people and said, no, you just need to show up. Just show up. Be here. Hand out the candy. Let the evangelists come. So we did. And it was amazing. This, they pulled up in a Jeep and they started walking up and down our neighborhood sharing the gospel with a bunch of people and nobody got saved until they came back to our driveway. And I look over at one moment and, and one of them is standing there and he's just got this whole group of high schoolers around him that he's preaching the gospel to. 
And then I look over somebody else, and one of the other ones is praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with another one. Ten people gave their lives to Jesus on Halloween. Several got prayed for to get filled with the Holy Spirit. It was so much fun. Why did it happen? Well, we just showed up. We said, Lord, we just feel like this is what you're telling us to do. Walk down this road, stay on this street, hand out candy, invite the wild evangelist, and let's just see what happens. We just showed up. And honestly, some of us get so uptight. We got this whole clenching thing oh, when it comes to evangelism. And honestly, half of it is just simply being where God wants you to be the moment he wants you to be there. And Philip just said, yes, Lord. Why? I don't know. Just go, right? Show up. Do the things that God wants you to do. I mean, one of the best ways to never be a good evangelist is to never be around people. <laughs> Isolation is the key to never being used by God for his kingdom. And sometimes we just need to show up, show up to work, show up to school, show up with your family. Maybe it's going to that family reunion that you hate going to, but God said go this year. So you, you show up. Now the story continues. Verse 27 says that Philip started out. He's just walking down the road. It's hot. It's dusty. He's thirsty. He's not knowing what he's doing, except he's obeying a clear word of the Lord. He started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the, I don't know how to say this word, Kandaki, Kandake, whatever, the queen of Ethiopia. Now the eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. This is so interesting. He knew of the God of Israel. He had already been to Jerusalem and he went to worship. And now he was returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the brook of the prophet Isaiah. Now this is significant. He's going, he knows that the Jews have the real God. But even in his heart, it's very significant that he's reading from, from the book of Isaiah, from this scroll. Because under the law in Deuteronomy and also in Leviticus, we're told that, that eunuchs were not allowed to come into the inner court of the temple. This is not the holies of holies. This is just the place where most worship takes place, the inner court. They weren't allowed. And so here's this Ethiopian. He's got this heart searching for God. And he's going to Judaism, and he's not finding what his heart is looking for. And he's reading the prophet Isaiah. I just want to read one of the prophecies from Isaiah. It says this. It's not going to be on the screens, but Isaiah 56, verse 3 says, Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say, The Lord will never let me be part of his people. And don't let the eunuch say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future, for this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy, who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give, for the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. So he's reading this, and there's this hope that's stirred up in this guy's heart. But he's just not quite sure how to grab hold of it. You can see the preparation. You can see the work of the Holy Spirit even before Philip encounters this man. And when we're doing evangelism, you have to understand you're not the one that does the saving. God is responsible for the saving. God's responsible to prepare their hearts, not you. You're called to be a witness, right? You know, if you're in a courtroom, I got called into jury duty. My trial got canceled. <laughs> Praise God. But I got called in, and you know, what, what, when you're in a courtroom and, and you're there maybe as a witness, right? There's the judge, there's the defendant, there's a prosecuting attorney, you've got the jury, you have all these things. It's really up to them to figure everything out. You're there just to show, to tell, to speak to what you've heard, what you've seen, what you've experienced, and that it. that's it, right? The verdict is up to somebody else. It's the same way when we're telling people about Jesus. We're called not to be the judges, we're called not to be the jury, we're called to be witnesses just to talk about Jesus what the word says about Jesus what Jesus has done in our lives and you can see in this Ethiopian that God has already begun to do this regenerating work through the power of his Holy Spirit he's just priming the pump getting his heart even hungrier to hear the gospel and so he's there and he's reading from from the scroll from the prophet of Isaiah now at this point Acts 8 verse 29 the Lord speaks again to Philip, and it says, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Now, remember, Philip had got a very clear, strong word from an angel of the Lord. Go down this path. Now the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, I want you to walk up to that carriage. And I'm just asking myself, okay, what's, what was the difference between the angel speaking and the Holy Spirit speaking? 
What did it feel like to have an angel, absolute certainty, absolute clarity, versus having the Holy Spirit? What was it like for, for Philip to hear the Holy Spirit? My opinion, and it's simply my opinion, but it's the only one I got, is I think this was just a gentle nudge from God. Very similar to what we experience often as Christians who are trying to hear the voice of God. It's referred to as a still small voice, just that nudge. Hey, tired of walking? Go up to that carriage. Philip could have easily passed over it. He could have easily said, no, I don't think that's why I'm walking. I'm supposed to get to Gaza. That's what the angel said. And there's just this nudge, this gentle, go up to the carriage from the Holy Spirit. And look how Philip responded. I love this. Verse 30. Notice that the Holy Spirit said, I want you to walk alongside the carriage. What did Philip do? It says, Philip ran over and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. So here's Philip. Holy Spirit nudges, go walk over to that carriage. And he's so quick to obey, he begins running towards it. I don't know if he freaked the guy out or what. This was a desert road. There were thieves. I don't know what that guy was thinking. But he began running over to that carriage. Brings us to the second point I want to make. Second key to evangelism, which is this. Obey quickly when God nudges. Number one, show up. Number two, when the Holy Spirit gives you those, those small nudges, just obey quickly. Run towards those. Well, how do I know if it's really the Holy Spirit? By trying it out. Just by going. You're never going to get more certain than you will by actually trying it. There's no other way. You learn to hear God's voice through trial and error. In the same way that a baby learns to speak English, learns to, you know, to speak whatever their native tongue is simply by being around it and trying things out over and over and over again. It's how we learn language. It's how we hear the voice of God and learn to. And so when the Holy Spirit gives you a nudge, you just go and you run towards it. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but there was one day when I had a huge to-do list. I mean, just, I had six different people that I needed to get in contact with in about a two-hour period. And I had a bunch of errands to do that day as well for the church. And I'm driving along, and I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me a nudge. I felt like he said, hey, go to Lowe's. And I was like, Lord, Lowe's is not on the checklist today. I'm not going to Lowe's. And I actually drove past it, and he said, idiot, go to Lowe's. Now, when the Lord says, idiot, I've learned, okay, I should probably listen to him. So I pulled a U-turn. I drove into Lowe's. Long story short, I met five of the six people that were on my checklist that day. Got to accomplish everything in about 15 minutes that would have taken me much longer. And it was like the Lord was saying, told you so. <laughs> you just learn to obey the nudges of the Holy Spirit when he says, this is where to go. This is who to talk to. You. And so Philip does. And it says, Philip ran over. He heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now Philip's going, oh, this is good. He's already reading the scriptures, right? And so Philip asked him a simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? When we're talking to people, when we're showing up, when we're obeying the nudges of the Holy Spirit, asking questions is the best, best method. Hey, do you understand what you're reading? Hey, what do you believe about the afterlife. What do you think is going to happen when we die? We just ask questions. We start with where they're at in that moment and begin to ask questions. Hey, you're reading something from the Bible. Do you understand what it says? And look how he responds. Verse 31, the man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? He's basically saying what Paul says, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord, right? He's hearing it, but he doesn't understand it. He needs someone to actually proclaim it to him. Paul will say, how can they hear unless someone is sent, essentially? And so he urged Philip to come into the carriage and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture he had been reading was this, from Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And now at this point, you can see Philip like salivating. He's beginning to drool. He's an evangelist. It's like the ball just got teed up for him. As an evangelist in that time, the gospels had not been written. All he had was the Old Testament. This is the most messianic passage in all of the Old Testament. 
This is like the one chapter that you want that dude reading, and he's reading it right now. He's literally reading about, about Jesus prophesied through Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came up on the scene. And Philip's just like, yes, well, let me explain to you. And he starts telling him about Jesus. Now look how it goes. I love this, verse 35. So beginning with the same scripture, and this is so important, start with where they're at. This is what you're reading? Well, let's talk about Jesus. And I love this. He starts right where he's at, but he always gets to Jesus. You start with wherever the person's at. What are they talking about? Oh, they love golf. Does anybody love golf? Okay, we'll pray for you. (laughs) Actually, I like golf too. Whatever they're interested, you start there, but you steer it towards Jesus. And so it says, so beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And this comes to our third key. You gotta show up, obey the nudges of the Holy Spirit, and the third, you just gotta open up. Just start talking. Talk about Jesus. Open up the scriptures. You may not know the scriptures really well. That's okay. John 3.16 is a great starting point. Just start with what you know, but then begin to open up. Begin to share about what God's done in your life, how Jesus has changed you. What's your story? What's the truth of God's word that you already know and you're confident in that you can share with another person? And he says, starting with that scripture, he began to open up, began to tell the good news about Jesus. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, but in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, some of us hate this verse because we think always be prepared to answer every apologetic question that anyone could ever ask. Is that what Peter's saying? No. Peter is one of the dumbest of all the disciples. Truly. What does he say you have to have an answer for? Why are you so happy and joyful and so full of hope? What's the matter with you Christians? Well, let me tell you. We have an answer for the hope. Does that mean that we're not supposed to study scripture? Absolutely not. We're supposed to be men and women of the word, loving the word of God, knowing the word of God, studying the word of God. But he doesn't say have an answer to every question they may possibly ask. Now, it's good if they have a question that you don't understand. You just go, I have no idea. Let me try to find out. But he says specifically, have an answer for the hope that's inside of you. When someone says, why are you so hope-filled? Why is there so much joy in your life? You point to Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus did. Let me tell you what life was like before Jesus. And let me tell you what life is like now in Christ. Give an answer for that hope. Peter will go on and really just explain so succinctly the gospel. Verse 18, he says, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Peter's saying, this is my answer. Christ died in my place. He was put to death in the body, but became alive in the spirit so that I could be alive in spirit as well. Right? This is what Christ did did for us. This is what Christ did for you. He took your place on the cross. We deserved what he got, and we got what he deserved. Eternity, heaven. And Peter's just saying, putting into words what Philip put into practice, give an answer for the hope. Remember, this Ethiopian was searching for God, but he didn't have hope. I'm a eunuch. I'm searching for something that that no other religion, nothing that's going on in Ethiopia has been able to satisfy. I'm searching, I'm searching for God. Here's a guy that seems like he's got a lot of hope. And Philip's like, let me give you an answer. Let me give you the reason why I have this hope. Picking back up with the story, verse 36, it says, as they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. This guy's a smart one. Why can't I be baptized? Now this is indicative of the fact that Philip didn't just share about Jesus, but he, he shared about next steps. He says, look, give your life to Jesus, and then you need to get baptized. If you've, if you've received Christ, your first step of obedience is to get water baptized. So the eunuch's hearing this, and he's going, okay, man, is there water? There's some water. What's preventing me from getting baptized? And so he ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him right then and there. I love it. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, still dripping 
wet from dunking this guy, Philip in the water with him. It says, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. He's got the hope now. He has the joy now that he's been looking for his entire life. Now, I love this. And we're going to wrap up in about 30 seconds. But I love this scene because here's this Ethiopian eunuch. He's had this experience with Philip, but Philip is snatched away, right? And I'm going, what if on that Ethiopian, what, what are the thoughts going through my head? I'm going, was this thing real? Have I just been, am I dehydrated? I know this is a desert. Like, did I just hallucinate this whole thing? What's happening because this guy's gone? But there's two witnesses that stayed with him. Two things that convince his heart, no, this is real. The first one was what? The water still dripping off his body from baptism. He's wet still. And it's interesting for us. I've heard this story over and over again from so many people. They say, look, I gave my life to Jesus, but I've just always had this, this doubt, this insecurity, kind of this voice in the back of my head saying, well, did I really do it right? I'm not sure I'm really saved. And there's all this doubt right? Did this thing really happen? Did it work? Do I really get heaven? And then they get water baptized. And I've heard this over and over and over again from people. They said, the moment I got water baptized, for whatever reason, those doubts went away. There was this certainty, this assurance of salvation that came into my life. And I think in some way, we're seeing the same thing with the Ethiopian. The the water's dripping off of his skin. He's like, no, this was the real deal. It happened. But then there was a second witness. It was the joy. He said he never saw Philip again. He's headed back to Ethiopia. As far as we know, he never came back to Jerusalem. But the joy went with him. There's a hope. There's a joy. And this is the same thing that Christ wants to give you. This is the same thing that stays with us. Life gets hard. And in fact, as a Christian, life typically gets harder. But there's a joy. There's a rejoicing. There's a hope that stays with us. That's a testimony to the fact we have been saved. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. What's the next step for you? For some, if you have Jesus, it's showing up. It's going where God tells you to go and just opening up your mouth and just talking about Jesus. We we had a men's event Friday night and I was doing it there. I was so encouraged by these wild evangelists because I'm really not an evangelist. So people were talking to me. I was just like, do you know Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? It's a simple question. Have you given your life to Jesus? Start asking questions, show up, start talking about Jesus. That might be your next step. For some of you here today, you've given your life to Jesus, but you've never been water baptized. We'll dunk you today. I'll let you drive, 12 o'clock, be there. For some of you, you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus, and today's the day to get right with God. Today's the day to experience the hope, the joy that that Ethiopian did. It's time to receive what Christ did for you to get right with God, to know that you have the certainty of heaven, but you also have the abundant life that Christ wants to give you. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come to the front, and we're going to pray right now. And I just, first and foremost, want to give you the opportunity, if you've never given your life to Jesus, to do that right now. And it's very simple. Just in your own heart, everyone just close their eyes, just in your own heart, you simply pray this, Jesus, I'm tired of being in charge of my life. I want you to be in charge. I know that I've sinned and that I've done much wrong. I don't want to be punished for that because you already took the punishment for me. And Jesus, I receive what you did on the cross. I want to turn away from my life of sin. I want to receive your forgiveness and I want to live my life for you. Would you come into my life right now? And from this day forward, you now get to live your life for Jesus. To become part of a church family, this or someone else's. Become part of a church family. And to walk that road of allowing Jesus to be in charge of your life. Here's what I want to do. If you prayed that prayer, I want to pray over you right now. That you get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's one of the, the, the promises that we get. That not only we have heaven, but God says that he's actually going to come and live inside of us. It's ridiculous and amazing. But I want to pray for you right now. Holy Spirit, for those that have just given their life to Jesus, would you come and fill them with power like Philip had? Would you come and fill them with with that joy and and hope that the Ethiopian had right now? And I pray that it would overwhelm them, overwhelm their senses, 
that it would overwhelm the sadness, the depression in their lives, that it would bring them to a whole new level of purpose and meaning and joy right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the work that you're doing. We love you, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.